Well, welcome again, everyone, um, to our launch event to celebrate 25 years of the Carpentries. It all began with a workshop led by Greg Wilson and Rick Gorda in 1998, when cameras were not as good at capturing clear images. 25 years later, it has grown to an international organization with community members from all over the globe. Whether in person or virtual, we all come together as a global community with shared values to accomplish a shared vision. Since 2012 and as of the end of 2022, we have supported over 4,000 workshops in 65 countries and trained 4,287 volunteer instructors to deliver our 45 collaboratively developed open lessons to thousands of learners. And today's event is the first in a series to celebrate these collective achievements. So we will be spotlighting different parts of the world where the carpentries have spread since the first workshop in 1998. Our next event will be um, August 17th, when we will be highlighting Australia and New Zealand. September will spotlight Africa with that event happening on the 28th. The final three have not been scheduled yet, but we will be spotlighting Latin America in October, Europe, Canada, and the US in November, and Asia in December. Um, to be notified when these events are scheduled, we ask that you register for the entire series if you have not already um, at the link that Talisha will share in the chat. So other than joining this and future events, there are many ways you can engage in celebrating this milestone with us. We are using hashtag Carpentries25 when posting to our social media channels, even if we cannot be together in person, considering sharing a piece um, of virtual cake. Um, we are also seeking video and written testimonials. If you or a colleague have a story to tell about your time in the community, we would love to hear from you. So let me um, introduce you to our guest for today. Um, Dr. Greg Wilson is a programmer, author, and educator based in Toronto. He co-founded and was the first executive director of Software Carpentry and has authored or edited over a dozen books, including Beautiful Code, The Architecture of Open Source Applications, Teaching Tech Together, and most recently, Software Design by Example. Greg is a member of the Python Software Foundation and a member of the Python, sorry, and recipient of ACM SIGSOFT's Influential Educator of the Year Award and currently works as a software engineering manager at Deep Genomics. So welcome, Greg. Um, next, we have um, Tracy Teal. Uh, so Tracy is the Open Source Program Director at Posit. Previously, she was a co-founder of Data Carpentry and the Executive Director of the Carpentries. She developed open source bioinformatics software as an assistant professor at Michigan State University and holds a PhD in computation and neural systems from California Institute of Technology. Tracy is involved in the open source software and reproducible research communities, including serving on advisory committees for NumFocus, PyOpenSci, EarthLab, and Carbon Plan, and has been working with open source communities developing curriculum and teaching people how to work with data and code as a developer, instructor, and project leader throughout her career. So welcome, Tracy. Um, next, we have Jonah Duckles. So Jonah um, has acted as an organizational leader in skills development and information systems design at private sector companies, universities, and international nonprofits. Jonah served as executive director of Software Carpentry from 2015 to 2018, growing the membership program and financial sustainability of Software Carpentry, Data Carpentry, and Library Carpentry together as the Carpentries. So um, today he is a consultant and co-founder of Organizational Mycology, a team that advises and supports organizations to help them develop learning organizations, grow their impact, and find financial sustainment in their efforts. Jonah received his BS in Forestry and Natural Resources in 2008, and a BS in Physics in 2001, both from Purdue University. So welcome, Jonah. And then finally, we have Carrie Jordan, um, currently serving as executive director for the Carpentries. Carrie has helped the organization build capacity for fostering a supportive and inclusive community of learners and instructors by promoting best practices in teaching and learning and leading initiatives that help the organization build accessible resources and support individuals from diverse backgrounds. Her commitment to inclusivity has led to innovative programs and resources that empower our community to acquire essential data 
data skills and contribute meaningfully to the broader open um, science community. Carrie is chair of the board of directors of Code for Science and Society. She holds bachelor's and master's degrees in mechanical engineering, a master's in education, and a doctorate in engineering education. So welcome, Carrie, and thanks to all of you for being with us today. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I am going to get us started um, with uh, some questions. And let me pin Tracy so she is with us as well. Let me find her. Here we go. There we go. Welcome, Tracy. <laughs> um, so we're going to get started um, just hearing a little bit about some of the origin stories uh, of the organization. So we'll start with you, Greg. Can you tell us a little bit um, about the origin of software carpentry? Sure. How's my audio? So it started in self-defense. Brent and I were both programmers working with scientists and I think some of you have heard the story about the physicist who was using, he was using functions in a 100,000 line file for version control because nobody had ever shown him that there were version control tools. We had people who were way smarter than we are spending days doing things that we could do with a shell script in 15 minutes. And in the mid nineties, I organized a couple of articles for one of the IEEE journals about what software engineers should teach computational scientists and, and other research scientists who didn't think of themselves as computational. And uh, John Reinders at the Advanced Computing Lab at Los Alamos saw this and basically said, put up or shut up. I'll put a bunch of people in a room. You come down for a week, show me you can make a difference. So Brent and I gave that a try. The first workshop, uh, if there was a mistake we could have made either in content or presentation, I don't know what it, and, and that we didn't, I don't know what it was. Like looking back on it, it was the wrong material taught the wrong way, but it still helped. It still made people aware that it didn't have to hurt this much, that there were things they could learn in an afternoon that would save them a couple hours a day for the rest of their careers. And if I can be permitted one other story, um, one of the things that made me decide to leave my position at the University of Toronto and put myself into this full time was that I was teaching some workshops to grad students at U of T while I was a professor in computer science. And I think a lot of you have gone through the lesson on the Unix shell and we reached the point where we show people how to write loops to run a bunch of commands on files. And I showed that and one of the women in the workshop began to cry. She was an ecologist and for, as I found out later, for about six weeks, she'd been coming into the lab every single night, start a job on this machine to process this file, start a job on the next machine to process the next file, get all six machines going, sit there and knit for half an hour until the jobs were done and then start off the next batch and the next batch and then go home and come in the next night because she had a thousand files to process. Nobody had shown her that she could automate this, but that's not why she was crying. She was in tears because from the remarks the two people sitting next to her were making, she realized that a couple of the other students in her lab knew full well what she was doing, knew that it could all be automated and hadn't told her because they thought it was funny. And that's when I decided that we needed to put this power in the hands of everybody, not just the people who think of themselves as programmers, but everybody, if we wanted to get more science done. So yeah, that's where this all started for me. Thanks so much, Greg. I'm going to um, uh, hand it over to Tracy now to tell us a little bit about the origin of data carpentry. Um, sure. Well, I, I love Greg's story, and it's always uh, a path along um, the same trajectories, I think, for all of the carpentries. And it was that um, I had been working with software carpentry and seen a lot of what Greg was talking about and the impact that had for people on them just feeling capable of, of doing things and excited, maybe a little frustrated, um, but mainly, you know, just seeing the, the potential of what was possible. And 
I was working in um, bioinformatics um, at the time and in an NSF um, bio center uh, called Beacon. And uh, we got all of the, the centers, the NSF centers together to talk about shared challenges. And they thought, oh, we're going to talk about, you know, infrastructure. Everyone needs better internet or we need a database or bigger computers. And um, a few of us who were there um, ended up talking about software carpentry. And wouldn't it be great if uh, there were lessons sort of tailored to biologists uh, that focused on being able to work with the data that all of the, the biologists were generating. Um, and so from there, I didn't think I'm like Ethan White, Karen Cranston. I don't know if you were at that meeting, but we went and we did a, a first workshop at Nescent, one of the bio centers, um, and kind of had a similar experience to what Greg was saying. I think one of my favorite comments from that session um, was usually I run away from the, these things screaming, but this time I didn't. Um, because, you know, people's traditional experience with like learning, uh, coding, learning, computing is just so negative. Um, and so that this person just like had this positive experience, um, was really important to us. Um, Kate Hurtwick was at that, uh, at that workshop. Um, so yeah, we kind of just, uh, went from there and, and kind of continued to to build on the, the software carpentry curriculum with um, biologists in mind, and then thinking, you know, more broadly, how we could kind of tailor the lessons um, for different types of research communities. Wonderful. Thank you, Tracy. And now I'm going to um, turn it over to Jonah to talk a little bit about the um, formation of the carpentries. Yeah, um, I'll give a little bit of a background of how um, kind of I got involved in the carpentries at the time I was at the University of Oklahoma um, helping on an informatics team there so I was in research support at the University of Oklahoma and we were in the process of getting the IT organization and the libraries organization to really support how we had available infrastructure and available skills and practices and so in some of that work I had started teaching these little one-hour lunchtime workshops where I asked a bunch of postdocs and graduate students to come sit in the conference room and do some live coding kind of activities. This is before I had found software carpentry at all. And then fortuitously, um, at one point, some someone had found out about software carpentry through the Mozilla um, Science Lab and said, hey, Jonah, you should go do one of these instructor trainings. I started in software carpentry instructor training and found all the things I was doing in the workshops, context switching and all kinds of things was leading to just horrible potential outcomes and got really in that continuous improvement loop of going, okay, what can we do to really make each workshop better? And in the process of that, I had a really amazing um, kind of dean of libraries that I worked under who was asking the question, how can we build the capacity institutionally for this? And fortuitously, again, at the same time, we were having these conversations and we built a membership committee inside of the, the software carpentry to kind of say, what would memberships look like? Um, Greg was, um, at, at that point in time, I think this might have been early 2015 or so, was saying like, hey, how can we how can we build some financial sustainability for this organization? So we had subcommittee meetings and things. And I went with some of those things and I went to the university and to that dean and I said, hey, can we can we be the you know one of the early members and yeah, sold the membership. And I went to the university across the state where we did a lot of co collaboration. I said, hey, you guys want to be members too? And sold two memberships in, in that first um, year. I never thought I was good at that stuff. Um, and, you know, found through the process of the carpentry some confidence both in my own teaching getting better and in this ability to kind of go off and um, build that kind of financial success for the organization. In the whole process of that, what brought the dream of the carpentries together was saying, well, the community is the same for data carpentry and software carpentry. There's a little bit of a difference in terms of what um, the way we might teach a workshop, the look and feel of that workshop would be. But could we demonstrate a real financial sustainability together as one organization? And the way we did that, as we said, you know, we have two separate organizations, um, but we're going to have one membership. And do our organizations agree to that? And then we demonstrated that, hey, we can bring in enough money with a, a revenue sharing plan um, to say, hey, this is viable. We can take this forward. Um, we have real annual recurring revenue. That's really the, the kind of basis for first sustaining organization. And, you know, in my time in the organization, I spent a lot of time um, hustling lots of different uh, kind of membership um, activity there. It was a lot of fun. 
Um, and really fun to see how the community really steps in to support all of these different communities, um, sub communities being built locally inside of organizations. And so for me, it's that that last mile boots on the ground. How are you changing the culture in each organization? That's really um, the most exciting part about um, what this this team does. Thanks so much, Jonah. Um, I now uh, want to turn to you, Carrie, to tell us a little bit about your journey with the Carpentries and um, ending up as its uh, executive director. My cheeks hurt from smiling so hard. So let me preface all of this by saying, wow, this is like, this is very incredible. Um, I came to the organization really at a crossroads. I was finishing, I was finishing up my postdoc at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Daytona Beach, Florida. I was doing a postdoc in engineering education. And it was a period where I needed to determine, am I gonna go the faculty route or, or do something else? And so I saw a, a role posted in higher ed jobs actually for deputy director of assessment for data carpentry. I had never heard of this organization. I had never heard of any of the tools that we teach, but I knew from the job posting that this was an organization I could make an impact with. Um, prior to doing my postdoc, I was, again, trying to figure out, am I going to work in more social impact organizations or am I going to be like a mechanical engineer and work on widgets? And so doing that postdoc, it really gave me the confidence to hone in on what, what's really important to me, which is impactful work. And so I applied for deputy director of assessment with Data Carpentry. I still really didn't know what we did until, and now, now I can tell you all this because <laughs> it's six years later. I, did, I really didn't get what we did until maybe six months into the job. And I was like, I cannot believe I never heard of these tools and these methods especially having done a PhD, I felt like my practices were awful and I was really embarrassed. Um, but that's kind of like how I learned about the carpentry or data carpentry at the time. And I've been through, you know, working with Greg, working with Tracy, working with Jonah, and it's been an incredible ride. Now, you asked me about executive director. I always knew that I wanted to lead a nonprofit. I wasn't expecting to do it so early. Thank you, Tracy. Um, but it, again, it has been a ride. It has been really incredible. And one thing I can say about Tracy, Jonah, and Greg is that they've they've been whispering in the background this whole time, giving me encouragement and the rest of our team. So it's been really wonderful. Right. It's so wonderful hearing all these stories. I love it. Um, we have a question that was posted to the Etherpad um, by someone, um, and I will paste it into um, the chat as well. Uh, just as a reminder, for anyone um, on the call that would like to uh, uh, ask a question, feel free um, to add that to the Etherpad or into the chat. Um, but the question is, what's your wild dream for the Carpentries in the next 25 years? So in 2048, what has happened? Anyone like to take that one first? Um, Greg. Yeah, I would like to see half or more of the executive of organizations like the Ecological Society of America to be certified carpentries instructors. I want the people who are making the decisions about how you get published, how you get tenure, where the funding goes, what problems people are encouraged to work on in a world that's getting scarier every day. I want them to have had the kind of training the carpentries provide and not just on the computational side. I want them to know how to teach. I want them to know how to collaborate across disciplinary boundaries and international boundaries, which you know, we, we talk about the thousands of people who've gone through carpentries instructor training. They haven't just learned how to teach, right? And I think those skills have always been important. And you know, looking at the weather reports today out of places like Phoenix, right? If we're going to tackle those problems, we can't do it with the institutions and the leaders we have today. They've had their shot. My generation has had its shot and we didn't make things better. We made things worse. 
So that's my hope. I want a capacity manager in every region very, very badly. Um, so we have Angelique Tressler. She's in South Africa and capacity manager for, for Africa. Uh, we have a lot of activity in South America and in Asia, of course, Australia, New Zealand, all over the world, but we don't have a dedicated staff role. Um, and you all know community management, it's a lot of work and it requires resources. It requires intention. And I would love to see a dedicated or two, you know, one or two um, people really working in each of the regions where, where we teach workshops so they so that they can really cater our or tweak tweak what we do for their communities and teach in the languages that they live and work in and things like that. I think that's super important. Um, and also want to see we so we've been talking a lot about obviously data and software carpentry, you know, merging to create the carpentries. You know, we onboarded library carpentry as well as the lesson program. And I would love to see carpentries in all of our libraries and museums. I think that's another, especially local libraries, because that's a way to really reach more people um, who are under-resourced. For me, um, I'm going to riff on a little bit of what Greg said, which is that we don't just learn how to teach in the carpentries. Um, what's been amazing in the carpentries community is that as you lean in to both the teaching and the skills that you might be learning in library data or software carpentry, um, you're learning skills of professional communication, of how organizations work, how to collaborate uh, differently and more openly. Um, you're learning about how to fix a get merge that goes awry um, among other crazy things in, in the carpentries, which are real life practical skills that we do watch a lot of our community members go off and um, shine with. It's amazing to me to watch the number of people who might not be active in the carpentries today that kind of got their start and built their confidence within this kind of community of supportive people. And so I want to see, you know, a couple of order of, order of magnitude orders of magnitude more of that um, in what the carpentries does. Well, I'll first share what I said that I thought the future of the carpentries was when an NSF program officer asked me like a year into data carpentry. They said, "Where do you see the carpentries in five years?" And I said, "I hope it doesn't exist. I hope that all of these skills are taught in the universities." Uh, you know, the the data science, the programming, the teaching, I hope it's a part of the infrastructure, right? And that like, this is the last time we have to be doing this like stopgap measures to like train everybody. Um, and oddly, they started laughing. It was strange. Um, and uh, they were right. Um, <laughs> so I do still wish that there was sort of more structural support uh, for all of this. But uh, the the blessing of that has been the emergence of the Carpentries community, um, because I think that that is not something that could be replaced uh, by, by infrastructure um, and is just really been the strength and continues to be the strength of the organization. So I would echo, you know, two things actually that, that Carrie said. One is, um, you know, the kind of regional idea, actually the theme of Carpentry Con, the only in-person one we've gotten to have yet. Um, but was building locally, connecting globally. I think, you know, especially now we're not traveling, those local connections, community care is so important. I would love to see like chapters of carpentries everywhere around the world. Um, that would be like such a dream. And then to have this place where they could come together and support each other. Um, and then my other one, I love that you said this, Carrie, is a carpentries in every library. Um, I think the library is just a really natural home um, for what we do around community and teaching and computing and just really access to data literacy because libraries are also like centers of our communities. So, so I'm thinking not just academic libraries, but like public libraries. Um, so both of those things are just so exciting to me. And I, I just I already see like such growth in, in all those areas. I love what's going on so much. And as long as the community stays together, I, I know there's so much potential. 
thank you all for um, those great uh, responses. It's also um, so interesting to hear so much alignment between all of you and thinking about what the future of the organization would look like. Um, I have another question. I'm, I'm pasting it into the chat, um, but you all have had important leadership roles in the organization at key points throughout its history. As you've watched the organization grow, what do you consider to be the biggest success you have witnessed? What left you inspired? I'll go first because I wrote my answer down to make sure that I was, <laughs> that I don't talk too long. Um, and for me, it is seeing how our material and methods are being used outside of workshops. So this year, I think this year, everyone decided to have an in-person meeting since we weren't meeting in person for the, for you, between 2020 and 2022. So I've had a lot of in-person meetings this year. Um, Earth Science Information Partners last week, there was a NASA CERN meeting, um, lots of meetings. And I'm always pleased and a little bit surprised to know how many people and how many organizations know about the carpentries and how many people come up to me and say, oh my gosh, we love the carpentries at insert literally everywhere, right? But what I'm learning our material and just, just our general pedagogy is being used so many ways that have nothing to do with necessarily the two day or four half day uh, workshops that we teach. And that has been very inspiring. And it's also frustrating because I wish I could figure, I wish there was a way I could crowdsource all of that information to really tell the stories of, of how far this information um, is being spread. So, I, so that's the success to see how, how this information is being used in so many different ways, even beyond what's being taught in our two-day workshops. Um, for me, it's kind of seeing the ways in which this kind of carpentries model, it's one of these chicken and egg things that you can't quite tell what came from the carpentries and what came from other places, but with so many communities are emulating this kind of inclusivity and openness and bringing in more voices. Um, and for me, one of the big successes is seeing carpentry community members who've gone off and created other things that are in the model. Um, I think that's a huge success and potentially is, as we kind of celebrate the 25 years, kind of enumerating and articulating those kinds of dotted line pathways um, could be interesting. It's not absolutely necessary either, but just watching that kind of um, evolution of people emulating this in, in many, many, many channels. Um, and it's fractal to me, like sometimes it's in your lab group, sometimes it's in the university wide kind of thing. Sometimes it's a meetup for your city that emulates it. Sometimes it's, you know, the state. Um, but it's, it's that kind of ethos um, and how the Carpentries as an organization has kind of supported that ethos and inspired people to go create um, other things has been amazing to watch. I'll take kind of a different tact because the, the question was about uh, leadership. Um, and so one of the big successes I think of the Carpentries that has been inspiring to me is actually all four of us here on this call um, and that we have had success, like that we have an organization and a community and a structure that has allowed for succession in the team and the leadership of the organization. There are just not a lot of organizations that that do that and just like the intentionality that everyone in the team, everyone in the community has put into like building the place, right, that we can all be a part of and that we can continue growing our leadership and that it isn't, you know, that I can see 25 years into the future because that exists. And I just don't see that that often. So to me, that's just just really a real success. And um, it's just amazing to see us all here together. It's been a while. I was going to say what Tracy just said, but as always, she beat me to it. So one of the things I think we should be proud of is that we stuck to our guns. There's always the temptation to go and chase big, shiny objects, right? 
And we stuck to those basic boring skills that make the most difference to most of the programmers. Yeah, I'm working for a biotech company right now, and we joke that you can get $100 million for telerobotic brain surgery. You can't get a million dollars for clean water, right? And, and we stick to those basic skills. We stick to the equivalent of, of teaching people how to read and write. And it's not as exciting as generative AI. It's not as exciting as quantum computing, but it makes a lot more difference to a lot more people. Right. We have another question that came in um, from a community member. I'm going to add it into the chat. I'm pretty new to this community. I have data fluency, but want to ramp up my data dexterity. I am a former teacher. What advice do you have for me? By the way, I attended ESSEP last week and appreciate Carrie's participation there. Should I answer that? Go ahead. I want to know what data dexterity is. So if you can just DM me your, your email address and I can definitely follow up afterwards as well. Um, but we have tip sheets. And Alicia, I want to commend you for the just the awesome work that you're doing running our community development team and all of the community development programming. We have these really great tools called tip sheets that give you a very plain introduction to the carpentries and how to get involved with teaching, with learning, and with con contributing. And so I think if we can put a link to that tip sheet, that way um, they can see how to sign up for instructor training or how to how to take a workshop. If there's if we have some workshops that are open to the public, I think that'll be a great first step. But also please send me your email address and then I can I can definitely follow up afterwards too. Does anyone else have a response around data dexterity and ramping up um, data skills? Maybe I would say it's sort of uh, as much as the skills, as much as carried it a whole, um, thesis on self-efficacy. <laughs> so this idea that you can do it, right? At the beginning, it doesn't feel like you can because you have to look everything up and everything is hard. Um, but as you do it, you can get to be more confident. And maybe you remember that command that you didn't remember the last five times, or you just more have a sense of what to do and, and know what to Google. Um, and so that sort of like feeling that grows that this is something that you can do will come and that is the most important thing because you'll never know everything the syntax is always changing you know there's always going to be something to look up but like if you are feel like you can do it then that's important and it helps you guide you to asking the right questions um you will always be googling that is my, or maybe Google won't exist anymore. I don't know. You will always be searching. <laughs> Fingers crossed. That, 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 that um, what Tracy was just talking about reminded me of a little bit of a different tangent too, which is um, at a workshop that we held at Oklahoma with um, my friend, Emily McTavish, who I met instructing at her university up in Kansas. Um, she and I were teaching and there was a dean, an associate dean who had come to attend this workshop to see what this carpentry stuff was all about. And he said to us, could you just maybe type a little bit slower so that I can get every single thing and not make any typos? And Emily, to her credit, stands up there at the podium and she goes, no, the typos are the pedagogy. And I think this is quoted in the instructor training somewhere um, to really say like embrace the the kind of errors and things and the challenges and the googling live googling and things that you don't understand and asking the crowd what they know um and this is really a community we do you know as a community there's expectations of you know how you you teach to a certain level but we're all growing and so just accept that you have something to to get from others in the community and you have something to offer to the community as well in every moment that you participate in the community. So that would be my advice on that front. If, if I could use this as an excuse to jump back to a previous question, 
what do I want to see not in 25 years, but in 10? I'd like to see a couple or three or four executive directors of the Carpentries who aren't from North America, Western Europe, who are coming up from such very different backgrounds. You know, the, the proudest moment for me of the last few years with the Carpentries was when I was no longer the person who had taught the most workshops. Right? Somebody I'd never met in Bangladesh had taken the record and was still running. All right. Carrie, you know, I hope you're with us for a very long time, but I would like to see. One of the mistakes I made was for many years thinking that the knowledge only needed to flow in one direction. I'm a programmer. I'm going to talk. You're going to listen. And there was so much that we could and should have been learning. And it wasn't until I started doing the reading and started listening, you know, people like Warren Coate, who's on this call. Right? who started saying, we actually know stuff about teaching. You don't have to invent this from scratch any more than people who haven't done a computer science course have to invent programming from scratch. So I think one of the strengths of the Carpentries is that at all levels, we've been willing to listen to people who know more than we do. And we've been willing to, to open the doors for people with very different backgrounds to come in and tell us how to do this better. And I'd like to see that continue and increase over the years to come. So that's not directly talking about data fluency and data dexterity, but I think that's been a theme through, through the last 13 years and through a lot of the answers we've had in the last half hour. I'm not famous for my ability to listen. I got to grant that, right? But as an organization, I think we're pretty good. Thank you all. Um, we have another question that came in um, from uh, the community. Um, it's in the chat. So the tech industry is continuously evolving with new tools and technologies emerging rapidly. How can the Carpentries ensure that the curriculum and materials remain relevant and up to date in the face of this fast paced change? Greg, I know you're. I was like, I see Greg shaking his head. <laughs> None of the topics that were in the top 10 for programmer interest on Reddit five years ago matter today. So many of these things. Who here cares about NFTs today? Right? How excited are you today about blockchain? Right? Again, one of the things I think we've done well. Is, is follow that old Russian proverb, what's oldest lasts longest, right? There are a few fundamental skills that we know everybody needs and those skills aren't gonna change. And yeah, as Tracy said, the syntax of the latest version of the tidyverse might change a little bit, but the ideas don't, right? And we've done a really good job of focusing on those things that you can learn once and carry with you for the, the rest of your working life. So I, I hope we don't start chasing taillights. Yeah, we're not doing that. But what we will do <laughs> is continue to engage our curriculum advisory committees, I think. And shout out to Toby, who's on the call and the entire curriculum development team. We have, we're going to continue to leverage our community. And, and I say this all the time, our community really is our strongest resource. We have curriculum advisory committees. We have lesson program governance committees and being able to rotate expertise, you know, keep people coming in, onboarding and offboarding members of those, those committees, those advisory committees, it's going to be super important because we want to stay, you know, current for lack of a better word. We always get those questions about how do we keep our curriculum up to date and those sorts of things. But like Greg said, you have to know the fundamentals. And I agree with you hundred percent. We, these are the skills that you need to launch off to do all of these other amazing things. Um, and the way we can continue to do that is leveraging our community. So our curriculum advisory committee. And if you are a curriculum advisor, or if you've ever submitted a pull request or an issue or anything like that, shout yourself out in the chat. We thank you. We appreciate you so much because that's, that's how we'll, we'll be able to um, stay current. Yeah, I, I would say kind of the community 
um, interest slash pain. It is a community of instructors uh, who teach a lot of things. Uh, and so where we see uh, lessons emerge from is from people saying, I need to teach this thing and I can't find materials to teach it. And enough of people finally get together and say, oh my gosh, we really need this lesson. You know, let's write it. Um, and so what I love that the Carpentries have done in the last few years is the Carpentries Lab, where people can come in and say, like, here's my idea. Do other people want to work on it? Start to work with the lessons that you have, like the infrastructure to write a lesson so you can focus on content and not infrastructure. So, you know, again, like if someone is super excited about NFTs and wants to write a lesson, OK, you know, they can. But the strongest lessons do tend to come from sort of the, the shared interest in that curriculum that usually comes from it being around for a little while um, and people really finding that it's something that they that they need to teach. So I love that pathway. Thank you all. We have a few more questions. I know we only have about 17 minutes, so I'm going to um, try to get to a few more. And if there are any questions that we can't get to, again, I'm going to ask folks to um, uh, respond on the etherpad after our session today, if, if you do have time. Um, but this question I just posted into the chat, do you have any advice for neurodivergent instructors on how to study and teach the learning material? I can take this if nobody else wants to. Um, as somebody with two neurodivergent people in my immediate family, um, I don't know enough to offer you advice because people can be neurodivergent in many different ways, but we know specialists who can tell us what we need to know. Right? We can go and find the people who can explain to us what we should be doing so as not to get it wrong. Right? So yeah, I, I would love to see more of that. In the same way that we have had people who know a lot more than I did just a few years ago, talk to us about the accessibility of our lessons. Right? In the same way that we've had people in, in different countries talk to us about the fact that not everybody has cheap high-speed bandwidth. Right? We're pretty good at listening and we can go and find people to listen to. One thing I would I would highlight here as well, um, and Bryn is on our on the call. Bryn is our accessibility manager, and we recently released an accessibility statement. We have an accommodations form, which is phenomenal. So if you're teaching a workshop or even attending a community discussion, there's a form that you can fill out that you can just share you know, your experiences and what accommodations might be helpful for you. And we have a pool of funds um, that we, that can support that. Also, if you're comfortable, you know, that that never teach alone is, or never never teach alone, never learn alone. <laughs> Don't do things by yourself. I think that's super important too. And I'll, that's one thing I would advise if you're comfortable, you know, learning and teaching with someone else. Great, thank you um, both. Uh, so I'm going to add the final question into the um, into the chat. Let me grab it here real quick. Um, so the 25th anniversary of an organization is a significant achievement. It is something to be celebrated, especially by the thousands of community members who have volunteered their time to build it from the ground up, uh, many of who are, whom are with us today. What is the final message you would like to share with the community before we wrap up today's session? I don't know who wants to go first. I'll go. Okay. <laughs> It's re, and I wrote it down, re-engage, re-engage. So I, I shouted the community development team out earlier, but it's really everyone on our core team. We have made, with the help of the, of the community, obviously, we've made strides in improving onboarding and offboarding. We all know how it feels to have a role that's indefinite. And so now we have clear 
onboarding and offboarding for all of our community roles. So if you were, if you stepped away from the carpentries for some time, not sure if you're ready to re-engage because you're not sure of what the time commitment is like, I can assure you it's very clear now. We have so many opportunities to teach a workshop, to get involved with curriculum development, to get involved with community development. And I just want you to re-engage. You know, sign up for the newsletter. You can start there. Um, re re-engage on our Slack thread. This is a great time to get involved. And so I think that will be my message. Um, I'm going to go back to a moment when I first became executive director of software carpentry, where we surveyed a whole bunch of instructors and we figured out some people were going through instructor training and weren't teaching for us. And then we commissioned some interviews to go interview those people and heard that every single one of them was an advocate for software carpentry at the time within their organizations, um, even if they weren't engaged. And so this is a way to say, absolutely re-engage as Carrie is saying, um, but, you know, there are ways if you're not able to spend that time engaged in slacks and meetings to go out and kind of push the the not push, but just you know make people aware of of the carpentries. I had a moment where I met someone sitting down on a plane next to me who had been to a carpentries workshop, and she was a graduate student. We were talking about it. And that was one of those like small world moments that was was just amazing, which is just like, here, have a pen, you know, at the time I, <laughs> I still had pens with me everywhere I went, but um, it, it was just one of those amazing moments and go make those moments for other people to realize that this is out there is all I'm saying. And you don't necessarily have to engage, but absolutely engage. <laughs> it was like a lot of pressure. Um... <laughs> um, I think, I, I, don't, I don't know what I would say, but maybe it's related to what Carrie Jonas says, but I think one thing that's interesting about carpentries is it becomes, even as you take like one instructor training, it doesn't, it's not just something you do, it's who you are. Um, and so you do take it with you where you go. And so it's always something to like tap into that is a part of you and the community is always here to like connect back to and I think right now it's really hard like a lot of things have changed um and sometimes it's hard to like find the energy to reconnect with people and not necessarily teach a workshop but just um you know, sit in a Slack channel and just kind of like remember <laughs> that, that part of yourself and like reconnect with some things that are like positive and joyful. Um, and um, so, yeah, I mean, again, I think it just kind of always goes back to, to community and what you can do together. And the first part of that is just being together. And I guess I would echo what everybody else has said and add that like the carpentries, you can be so close to it that you don't realize that it's, for many of us, a stepping stone, a place to practice, a place to learn, a place to make friends so that you can go and tackle other things, right? Absolutely, we want scientists to have proper coding skills. But I want them to get paid properly. I don't want postdocs who are hustling side jobs to put food on the table, right? I think we all want academic interview and promotion to be fairer than it is today, right? And I think the carpentries are a chance where people can learn those skills and practice those skills with support, with friends, with people who will help them get better so they can turn around and apply them to other problems that are going to have larger impact. Right. Thank you all so much. This has been wonderful. It's been so great to hear from all of you. Um, I wanted to take just a little bit of time. Um, I am sharing my screen again. 
Um, but before we go, let me make this full screen here. Um, but before we go, I want everyone to type into the chat an answer to this question. Don't hit enter until I say to. Um, but the question is, how has the Carpentries made an impact on you or someone you know? If this is your first exposure to the Carpentries or if you're not aware of any impacts the organization has had, you can sit and relax for the next couple of minutes. Um, but for those of you who can answer, um, please do so. Type your response into the chat. Do not hit enter until I say so. So I'm gonna give us a couple of minutes. If you wanna hear the Jeopardy going behind in the background. <laughs> I'll give it 30 more seconds. All righty, hit dinner. So I just want everyone to take a moment to just read the responses to that question. Um, I think a lot of what we've heard today, we notice that there's just been a lot of um, lives that have been changed even from um, participation in this community. And so I uh, really just wanted us to really pause and um, appreciate all the time and all of the work that everyone's put into making this community what it is and um, for the 25 years. And so, um, yes, uh, please, please take some time. Um, we do have a minute. I don't know if there is anyone in the audience who um, would like to raise your hand and unmute yourself to make any comments. <laughs> Greg. I would just like to thank Brent Gorda, who couldn't be with us today. Um, without his hard work and his patience, this would never have started. Thanks for that, Greg. Just want to say thank you to everyone that is on this call and everyone in the community, especially to Carrie and the team uh, that put this all together, keep it all going, and make us proud every day to be a part of something that keeps going. And so it's just such deep gratitude um, for everyone. Thank you. Um, Justin, you have your hand raised. We can't hear you, Justin, if you're speaking. How about uh, that? Is that any better? Yeah, we can hear you better? now. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just also want to say thank you as somebody just from the community from a long time ago. I was at a, a workshop probably... How long ago was it, Greg? A while. 15, 15, 16 years. And then taught for quite taught for a while with software carpentry. It's been a while, but you've everything that the carpentries did changed the entire trajectory of where I was going. So just very much appreciative to Greg and everyone who started it and kept it going for all this time. It's been very very inspiring. Thanks, Justin. We'll end with a comment from Kate. Um, I just wanted to say that my comment about how the Carpentries changed my career trajectory is uh, brief, but it. I also wanted to highlight, it's not just the coding, like I had leadership opportunities through the Carpentries that my own university when I was faculty could not give me, right? And so it's like, 
the pathways to becoming involved and working with teams that are distributed and getting into open source in a way that's friendly um, and then being able to help guide an organization in community governance is what landed me the job that I have now, which is so far away from where I thought I would be, um, but is making an impact in much bigger, better ways than I ever thought possible. Thanks so much, Kate. And thank you all for sharing all of your comments and thoughts in the chat. It's been great to read. Um, I just wanted to um, end by uh, sharing my gratitude with all of you. Um, thanks to our guests for being with us today. Um, let's give a round of applause as much as we can for, <laughs> for virtual applause. Um, but also to everyone, um, everyone to, who attended and to all of our community members around the globe, um, you all are at the heart of what makes this community so special and amazing to be a part of. And I just cannot wait to see what we are all able to accomplish together in the years to come. So thank you. Thank you all so, so much. Um, and as another reminder, if you are here for instructor checkout, be sure to send that um, uh, communication to the instructor training email address that I mentioned earlier. So thanks again, everyone. Happy birthday, carpentries. <laughs>